In this video, I'm going to explain how to interpret the results of the oculomotor exam. I'm going to also introduce the treatment approaches that are used, but I'm going to save their explanations for separate videos, so make sure to check those out, and the links to those will be in the description of this video. Now remember, with the oculomotor exam, there are some tests that are more suggestive of peripheral vestibular deficits, or hypofunctions. That's what we're going to look at first. And those test results would be a positive head thrust test, a positive head shaking nystagmus test, and a positive gaze evoked nystagmus test with direction fixed nystagmus. Now remember that the gaze evoked nystagmus test has two types of results that depend on the nature of the nystagmus. The direction changing nystagmus is more indicative of a central deficit, but when it's direction fixed, that's more indicative of a peripheral vestibular deficit. Now, in general, if somebody actually has a hypofunction, the results of these tests should match up to confirm or rule up that pathology. So, if somebody has a hypofunction and you do the head thrust test and it's positive, you can't assume, but most likely, these other two tests are also going to be positive. So, they should match up with each other, and they should also indicate the hypofunction on the same side. So, it wouldn't make sense if your head thrust test indicated a right hypofunction, but maybe the other two indicated a left. They should match up in terms of being positive or negative, and if they're positive, they should also match up with the same side. So all right-sided or all left-sided, or in the rare case that they're both, all both. So if these tests are all positive, suggesting a peripheral vestibular deficit, or hypofunction, what do you do about that? What's your treatment approach? Well, in general, the treatment approach is to give an adaptation exercise. And in general, adaptation exercises are gaze stabilization exercises. When somebody has a hypofunction, there's a mismatch between the vestibular information coming from one ear and the vestibular information coming from the other. And that causes impaired gaze stabilization. So the exercises we give need to target improvements in gaze stabilization. And in general, those are these exercises right here. The most basic one, which is almost always given at the start, is the VOR times 1. Now there's a progression of that and a regression. The progression is more difficult. That's the VOR times 2. And then the regression is called gaze shifting. Gaze shifting is not given very often. There's really two major conditions where it's given. Number one, when the VOR times one is so intense for the patient that it causes severe dizziness-related symptoms that don't reduce immediately. They take a long time to come back down, and it basically ruins the person's day. Okay? So high severity, high irritability of symptoms. And then the second case it's given is when the person has such impaired gaze stabilization that they cannot keep that visual target, the X, in focus during the VOR times 1, even at slow rates. And so you have to regress it to gaze shifting. And again, we'll talk about all those in the next two videos. We're going to switch gears now and talk now about the components of the oculomotor exam that are specific for central vestibular deficits and what to do when you run into this. So what test results are specific for central vestibular deficits? Well, first of all, if somebody presents with abnormal smooth pursuit, abnormal convergence, abnormal saccadic eye movement, abnormal VOR cancellation, and then also there's one that we normally think of as a peripheral test, but it also has a central result, and that's a positive gaze evoked nystagmus test. Now, remember that depending on the nature of the nystagmus, it can indicate either peripheral or central deficits. So when you have direction-fixed nystagmus, that indicates a peripheral pathology. But when you have direction-changing nystagmus, that's indicative of a central vestibular deficit. Now remember that in general, if somebody has a central vestibular deficit, the results of these tests should match up to confirm or rule up a central pathology. So there are cases where someone might have one isolated abnormal or positive test, but in general, if somebody actually has a central vestibular deficit, so following a traumatic brain injury, or maybe they have multiple sclerosis or something like that, these tests should all match up to confirm and rule up 
that pathology. So if somebody presents with these impairments, what is your treatment approach? And in general, the treatment approach for central vestibular deficits is going to be habituation. You're going to be prescribing habituation exercises. However, we can be a little bit more specific than this. So individuals with a central vestibular deficit can also have impaired gaze stabilization. Now recall that the tests that are more suggestive of peripheral vestibular deficits, so a positive head thrust test, a positive head shake and nystagmus test, and then a positive gaze evoke nystagmus test where you have direction fixed nystagmus, those are indicative of a hypofunction, but then the treatment approach would be adaptation, so gaze stabilization exercises, but those are all negative. And so how do you know if somebody has impaired gaze stabilization? Well, you're going to give what's called the Dynamic Visual Acuity Test, or the DVA, and it uses this eye chart like this, and we covered this in a separate video. And recall that Dynamic Visual Acuity integrates both central and peripheral mechanisms, and so depending on the result of this test, it will indicate if somebody has impaired gaze stabilization. So the first result of this could be it's normal. Remember, normal for the DVA would be a two-line difference or less. And so if DVA is normal, then the person likely does not have impaired gaze stabilization, but they still require habituation exercises due to having a central vestibular deficit. Now the other result of the DVA could be that it's abnormal, so it's a three-line difference or more. Now they're still going to require habituation exercises because they have a central vestibular deficit, but having an abnormal DVA suggests that their gaze stabilization is impaired. And what do we do to promote gaze stabilization? We give an adaptation exercise. And remember from the previous videos, the main adaptation exercises that promote gaze stabilization are these right here. The most basic one, which is almost always given first, is the VOR times one. The VOR times 1 can be progressed into the VOR times 2, which is more difficult, and it can be regressed into gaze shifting. And we've already talked about these in the previous videos within this playlist, but what we have not talked about is habituation. What are habituation exercises, and what is their rationale? How do we do them? And that's what we're going to be covering in the next couple of videos. So make sure to check those out. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of what to do if your patient presents with results that are consistent with a hypofunction or results that are consistent with a central vestibular deficit. In the next few videos, we're going to be covering adaptation exercises and habituation exercises in much more detail, so make sure to stick around for those. Thank you for all your support. Be sure to check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.